So I just wanted to welcome you all. Oh, this is so much fun. I can't even tell you how much fun I'm having. Uh, this is our first in the series of Women Erased. I have to give uh, a thanks right off the bat to Rita Houlihan, who's on our board and lives in uh, New York City. She's always generating these incredible ideas. And she said, let's do a series. And so uh, Russ and I were thrilled about the idea. And so this is the first part. And so thanks to Rita for, uh, for you know, bringing that wonderful idea to our attention. My name is Deb Rose Milovec. I am the co-director of Future Church. And I'm here with Russ Petrus, who is all, the co-director as well. And he's our technical guru. So uh, if you have questions, if you have problems, you can write them in the chat, and uh, and Russ will try to help you that way as well. Um, so just to start off with a little bit of an intro, uh, if you are a woman in the Catholic Church, you no doubt experience what it's like to be demeaned and uh, dismissed and silenced and erased. <laughs> The reasons for this phenomenon are manifold, but tonight we're gonna to focus on just one aspect of this. And I'm gonna start with a quick story. If any of you know, uh, Sister Ruth Fox, who wrote uh, Women in the Bible and Lectionary. So she offers an, an experience that I think is pretty universal for Catholics and Catholic women especially. So after she gave a four hour presentation on women in the Bible, one of the participants said to her, I never knew Jesus had women disciples. And the woman was puzzled as she, why she had never heard this. And I feel the same, I feel that same way, like growing up in the Catholic church, why didn't I know these things? And so she said every week she heard the scripture readings and listened to the homilies, but she never knew that Jesus had women disciples. It just didn't come up in what she had learned uh, as she attended Catholic church and Catholic school and Catholic religion classes. And so um, Ruth Fox says that the, the revisions in the lectionary mandated by Second Vatican Council suffer a serious flaw. And she says that uh, this revision leaves out women in a disproportionate way. So after a careful analysis of the lectionary, she says, women's books, women's experiences, and women's accomplishments have been largely overlooked. And in the assigned scripture readings that are being proclaimed in our churches on Sundays and weekdays, women have effectively been erased. So I don't know about you, but I'm a mother of five children. Uh, and when I brought my girls, four of them are girls, and my son brought them to church, they learned a lot about the, the faith of their forefathers, but very little about the faith of their foremothers because number one, I didn't know it when they were littler. And of course they didn't learn it in church. So tonight we're gonna to take another step in reclaiming our heritage, uh, the heritage of women within the church. And to do that, we're happy to be joined by Professor Michael Papard of Fordham University who will discuss how we have come to this lackluster understanding of the authority of early Christian women. So uh, just a few ground rules. So we're gonna be recording this conference. So those who could not be here will be able to see it later. And we're gonna to try to keep us on time. So I will be possibly stepping in at times, uh, especially as I go to the uh, question and answer section at the end, just so that we all our, uh, we can finish within the hour. So if you have any other questions, you can send them to me that don't get addressed. You can send them to me at debrose at futurechurch.org. So we're gonna begin this evening with a prayer and Russ is going to lead that prayer. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara's gonna lead that prayer. <laughs> Forgotten. Hey, well, it's wonderful to be with the Future Church again and our opening prayer. We give you thanks, O oh God, that in every age you raise up holy, wise, and courageous women who lead us closer to you and to one another through their faithful witness, leadership, and ministry. We pray. May their presence in our scripture and history, in our communities and lives, increase our desire for the wholeness you planned. May their witness embolden our work for justice and equality. 
May their faithfulness inspire as we seek to respond to your call in our lives. And may they encircle us as a great cloud of witnesses, tonight and always strengthening us with their prayers as we work to recover and reclaim them for ourselves, for our church, and for our world. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. And then we're going to turn to Rita Houlihan, who's going to introduce our guest tonight. Hi, thank you very much. Um, this is Rita Houlihan, and I'm here from uh, sunny New York City. And um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, greet everyone and um, to welcome Michael to this first, we hope maybe it's just the first of many uh, presentations he may do for us. So Michael, as um, Deb said, is uh, the first uh, in our series of Women Erased. And um, he is a gentleman and a scholar, as they say. Uh, he's a professor of New Testament, early Christian studies, religion, and public life here at Fordham University in uh, New York, with a special interest in early Christianity, art and ritual, religion, polit and politics, and the languages of Greek, Coptic, and Aramaic. In fact, I just learned from his very interesting Twitter account that his most difficult exam was decoding an Aramaic, I think, magic bowl, but maybe you can explain that later, Michael. Um, he's also trained as a papyrologist, which if you read his fantastic article in Common Rail, he mentions, and again, maybe we can explore that a little. So um, one of the things, uh, his first book, The Son of God in the Roman World, sounds great. I'm going to have to get that. It's a um, looking at the idea of divine sonship in its social and political context. And it won the Manfred Lautenschlager Award for Theological Promise. And his 2016 book, which is was really um, groundbreaking, re-examined the interpretation of the uh, art in the world's oldest church, um, the Bible art and ritual at Dura Europas in Syria. And um, that's a wonderful uh, reinterpretation of the artistic remains of that, uh, what, what is the oldest datable uh, church building that we have. Um, his scholarly articles have appeared in over a dozen journals of biblical early Christian and liturgical studies, Jewish Christian relations and Catholic theology. And um, however, he also invests, um, and this is something that's very near and dear to my heart, he also invests time and thought into communicating his research results to us, the interested public, the, um, because we are the pilgrim church, we are the ecclesia. And Michael has a way of taking that research and um, form formulating it, bringing it to us. Um, and his article, which uh, Deb and Russ, Russ set out, uh, sent links to in Commonweal is a real treasure. It's already being used as a teaching um, device in, I know, from a couple of professors. His article is called Household Names, Junia, Prisca, and Phoebe in Early Christian Rome. And it's published in um, the April 23rd, 2018 issue of Commonweal. Um, you can get it for free, but if you have anything extra, please support Commonweal because they really do some great material. So um, with that, I will... Um, turn it over to Michael and so he can have as mo much time as possible. And um, I hope people will ask questions. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to my um, dear friend, Diane Dragonetti, who advised me that Women Erased really was the best title for this series. And when we were debating whether what to call it. So with that, I turn it over to Michael. Thank you so much. Um... Can you give me a thumbs up if the volume level is okay? Okay, great. So as, as we're all learning here in this world of uh, telecommuting and Zoom, uh, we, we have to check our check all the levels and check out our connections. I'm, I'm here in uh, my seventh grade daughter's room for this evening where there, I don't have my own space here, so we're kind of all moving around, um, but we're, we're making it work. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation and, um, and Rita, the very, very uh, too too long introduction there. You, you don't have to list every <laughs> list it all, but I really appreciate seeing your face uh, even on the screen. Uh, they've asked me to talk for twenty five minutes or so, which will leave plenty of time for questions. And and what I thought uh, I would do tonight is start with uh, with just 
two quick points and then get into uh, my examples. The, the, the first thing I want to start with is when we think about uh, women in the Bible and women in the lectionary as, as a Roman Catholic, uh, the first two names that come to mind are the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, of course. But this particular audience, this future church audience, I was thinking, am I really going to talk about those two with this audience? I think they, they're they going to know as, as much as I do about, about these two women, which are very much a focus. And I thought we can certainly we can certainly talk about that. But I thought maybe the time might be spent better and be more um, generative for you of new thoughts if I focus on uh, some other some other women who have been erased from the lectionary. Um, so I just want to say that right off the bat, if you're wondering at the end why I didn't talk about those two, it's because I know that they're often a topic of conversation and I wanted to add some different names into the mix. Uh, my second uh, initial point is, is just to reinforce something um, in, I think it was Deb's intro introduction, which is that for, when we talk about women um, in the lectionary, for, for Catholics, the lectionary functionally is the Bible. If you look at Catholic in, um, um, knowledge of scripture, Catholic um, engagement with scripture, uh, sociological studies bear out the fact that Catholics by and large still are not doing much of this. That is, the act of individual private Bible reading or even small group Bible reading is, is still quite uh, quite rare, quite infrequent. Uh, certainly below 10% of, of practicing Catholics would consider themselves regular Bible readers. Um, so, so when we're talking about changing theological conceptions, changing ethical conceptions uh, in the church, the lectionary really is the the point uh, at which we should focus if we're trying to think about uh, Catholic attitudes toward uh, biblical stories. So it's a very, very important uh, focus for that reason. Um, <clears throat> so then moving on to, to some examples for tonight, and some of them I'll read and some of them I will just uh, refer to and kind of summarize the stories in the interest of time. I want to start with a couple uh, uh, in couple, a couple important erased women from the Hebrew scriptures, from uh, what is often called the Old Testament, uh, women who are obviously important and absolutely should not be erased from the accounts that deal with them. So, so one uh, quick important example would be uh, the women that we usually call the Hebrew midwives. So this is in the story of Exodus, uh, the story of uh, Exodus from Egypt, um, at, and the birth of Moses, in which, and this one I will read, in which uh, the king of Egypt, or that is the Pharaoh, told the Hebrew midwives, um, one of whom was called Shifra and the other Puach, when you act as midwives for the Hebrew women and see them giving birth, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she may live. So this is when the Pharaoh is frustrated with the numer numerous growth of the Israelites and wants them to suffer. The midwives, however, feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt had ordered them, but let the boys live. So the king summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you acted thus, allowing the boys to live? And, and then notice what they do next. The midwives answered Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are robust and give birth before the midwife arrives. So, they're, they lie. They clearly lie. They make up a story that he wouldn't understand because he's a man and a king. He doesn't know anything about birth. He's not allowed in the room, right, so to speak. So he doesn't know. And then it said, that's their answer. And then it says, therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. The people, too, increased and grew strong. And because the midwives feared God, he built up families for them. So they are rewarded with abundance. And then, and then the story continues with Pharaoh commanding the, the boys be thrown um, into the river uh, if they're born. If you read, uh, if you, I mean, sorry, not read, if you're listening to the lectionary version of Exodus 1, that story is snipped right out. So you get the, the orders of Pharaoh, um, the kind of angry orders about his frustration and that he wants the Israelite children killed. And it skips the midwife part and then goes straight to the command to throw them in the river. 
So just ponder even with that one example, what's lost by snipping out that story. Um, what's lost is the, the tremendous faith, the tremendous faith in God of these two women uh, when faced when facing a uh, Pharaoh who has enslaved their people and who is in that very moment bloodthirsty. He's interested in uh, vengeance on the Israelites. So faith, in a, in a, in a sense, what uh, of a martyr's faith, where they're really in, in a situation of fear for their own lives. But then the, their form of resistance is nonviolence. It's a form of nonviolent resistance, and, and that involves a clever, some clever trickery, right? Um, so nonviolent resistance to a tyrannical power that involves some trickery. And if we want to take the zoom out big picture, we could say that this story also is a significant woman, women's intervention in salvation history, in the story of the liberation of the, the Israelite people and the, and the birth, of course, of Moses, which leads to that. So that's just one story, right? Think of all of the things that could be squeezed out of that story, all the juice we can squeeze out of that one story if it were in a lectionary to be preached upon every three years uh, uh, from the story of Exodus. Another example uh, from the Hebrew scriptures is a little bit more difficult to parse uh, or to explain, um, but I'll just say a couple words about it. It comes from Second uh, Kings, uh, which is pr not, it's not a page turner, I'll be honest. It's not, it's not um, one of the parts of the scriptures that you're really excited to get to in your one-year Bible or whatever it is you read. But um, but this part of 2 Kings chapter 22 is about a righteous king named Josiah. And Josiah comes down in Israelite history all the way through Jewish history as, as one of the great righteous kings um, who, who was known for uh, reform and known for um, kind of reestablishing the Torah in Jerusalem, reestablishing the covenant in Jerusalem. And in the narrative of Josiah's reign as king, uh, there is a moment, and I'll just um, read a couple lines from it. There, there's an important moment where uh, the high priest of the temple in Jerusalem discovers um, discovers the book of the law in the temple. So they're kind of rebuilding the temple and discovers the book of the of the law of the Torah, and is consulting various people about uh, what he has found. And it says in Second Kings here, and and by the, and so this is a part that is that is not in in the narrative, right, that's snipped out of the weekday lectionary, that what he does is Hilkiah the priest and all these other, uh, all these other names, men's names, they go to a certain part of the city of Jerusalem where, quote, the prophetess Huldah resided. She was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, blah, 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 yada, yada, on and on. So describing who she is, and then she delivers two prophetic um, injunctions. To, to these uh, male visitors who have come to her, and then they deliver her message back to King Josiah. Uh, so there's many details in there that we don't need to get into right now, except to say what's also lost here, uh, a, a different kind of thing than was lost in the first example, where we have a, a woman clearly named as a prophet, um, a married woman, by the way, which is also kind of interesting. Sometimes we think about a prophet figure as being I don't know, um, more like John the Baptist kind of off single in the wilderness or something. But here we have a, a married woman who's living in a regular house in the city of Jerusalem and a righteous king, the high priest and the righteous king want to go consult what she has to say about the discovery of the Torah, about a, a discovery of a, a scroll of the Torah in the temple itself. So a prophetic voice during the reign of a clearly righteous king with a high priest consulting with her for her for her wisdom and her insight about the reestablishment and reform of the central covenant of Judaism. All right, so this is uh, an, another another great example of of the sort of of figure that that really ought to be in a lectionary if the lectionary is trying to represent the full biblical witness. So, two examples there from uh, from the Hebrew scriptures that to me are 
uh, inspiring and and, uh, and, I, and I wish as a person of faith who listens to the lectionary, I wish that I could hear sermons every three years on these stories. Moving, uh, moving to, uh, to the New Testament, to the Christian scriptures, I, I have to say a few words. I, I know that Rita and, or, and others uh, sent around my article that I, that I did for Commonweal last year or a couple years ago, but um, I just want to say a few words about it in case people haven't read that or, or to uh, inspire them to have a look. Uh, I had been looking for years of, during teaching Intro New Testament at Fordham, looking for years for a good article about some of these uh, forgotten women of the New Testament who were mentioned maybe only once or twice. And I, I'm looking for an article to assign for my, for my students and I couldn't find it, so I wrote it one day. <laughs> so that's that. That's how this article came to be, and and um, very very um, you know gl glad to uh, the Commonweal would, would run that for me, and that I could uh, keep distributing it to my students in that way. I by the way, I don't normally assign things I write. It's a little bit uncouth, but in this case, um, I couldn't find one. So so there we go. But what did I do in this article? I um, I really focused in on one paragraph of the end of Paul's letter to the Romans. And Paul's letter to the Romans is, of course, one of the most significant texts in the history of Christianity, uh, which deals with matters of, of salvation, deals with relationships between Jews and Gentiles, deals, deals with matters of Christian ethics and Christian ritual and the meaning of baptism and the meaning of, um, uh, meaning of Christ's death, all of these very, very important things. But Paul had never been to Rome at this point. And so at the end of a letter um, where, uh, to a place that you want to visit, which he very much did, he was planning to go, um, Paul then greets all these people at the end of Romans, and by far the longest list of people that he's greeting. And what he's doing there at the end of Romans, is chapter 16, is he's trying to uh, you know, ingratiate himself to this place that he, has, he wants to visit, it's, of course, the most important city. It's, of course, the wealthiest city in the Roman Empire. And he wants to ingratiate himself with them because he, he's going to come there and he needs support. He needs financial support. He needs material support. You can't just get an Airbnb in the year, you know, 64 and, like, show up. Uh, you, need, you need people. You need support. You need a, a, a means of, of securing your bodily safety and you need a, you need a place to stay you need a little bit of money and also Paul's a traveler he's following his life's vocation of traveling around the world to spread the idea that that God's salvation is open to Gentiles that's his life's work and he wants to go to Rome and get supported in order to go he says to Spain which for him is the the end of the world like he wants to go all the way to the great ocean okay all that is to say he's reading all these people at the end of Romans to establish these connections. Like, look at all these people, look at all these names that I know, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not such a, I'm not such an unknown figure to you. Okay. So the first things, the first people he talks about there, the first two names are women's names. And this, this is just this tiny little fact that I want to shine a spotlight on and make sure that, I don't know, make sure that people don't miss uh, because it, it, it's been missed for centuries. Uh, and and in, in the case of the lectionary, it's, it's, it's in part inten intentional. So what does he do first there at the end of Romans? Um, let me just read uh, the New American Translation. He says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is also a, this translation says minister, uh, diakonos, could also be translated deacon of the church at Cancrii, which is a town near Corinth, uh, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the holy ones and help her in whatever way she may need from you, for she has been a benefactor to many and to me as well. Now, as, as Rita told you, uh, I spent uh, many years studying uh, Greek papyri, ancient, ancient documents. Uh, many boring years, I should say. I spent many, many boring years studying with a crotchety old 
papyrologist named Anne, who trained me to read these things, which are basically scraps of trash discovered in Egyptian trash dumps. Um, by the way, which led to my my late beloved father saying to me, "So you're going to you're you're, you're going to do a PhD and you're." spending six years making no money living in this library and you're actually reading people's trash. Like that's, <laughs> that's what you're doing with your life. Yes. Yes. Dad. That's what I was doing. Okay. So back, back to the, back to the new Testament. So the study of ancient letters and ancient papyri, what, what, what that is. Uh, one thing that I know from that is that when you finish your letter in the ancient world uh, and then you commend or recommend someone at the end of your letter, almost always what that means is that the person recommended or commended is carrying the letter. So why don't you let that sink in for a moment. So the letter to the Romans, we think of it as you know, holy and scriptural, and it's, it is all those things. It also was a real piece of paper a real piece of papyrus that really was delivered uh, before it became thought of as holy in scripture. So Paul doesn't have access to the Roman military mail system, which is the only kind of mail system there was uh, at the time. So what people did is they relied on private couriers or they relied on uh, couriers for, or they could rely, rely on couriers for hire. Uh, in this case, if Paul's writing from Corinth and he commends a woman named Phoebe, who's from the church at Cancreae, which is right next to Corinth, I think it's 100%, and most, most scholars, I think, biblical scholars would agree, um, it's close to 100% certain that this is Phoebe, Paul saying to trust Phoebe who's carrying this letter, right? And, give her a place to stay and listen to her. And she's one of us, you know, she's, she's our people. A second point. So, so that's already right there. That, and this is not in the lectionary. So Romans 16, one and two is nowhere mentioned. And you can imagine why Roman Catholic lectionary didn't like the idea of a woman being called a deacon and giving her this, this role in the letter to the Romans, right? It's to, it's to Rome. But what's even more interesting to me beyond that, and that's already interesting, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, ancient letter writers also, um, we, have, we have evidence, uh, lots of evidence of ancient letter writers authorizing their couriers to help understand the letter. So if you send a, if you send a letter to someone and they have questions about its contents, about what something means, and most of these are business transactions in ancient letters, right? Where you're making a deal for a piece of land or something like that, and, and someone might have a question about it. The courier is usually understands the intention of the author. Does that make sense, right? So if it's, a, it's, a, it's a friend or a trusted courier, they can explain what's in there. So Phoebe being the courier, I'd say I'm, I'm basically sure about, but I would say I'm also reasonably confident that. Phoebe would have been an authorized interpreter of what was in the letter. If, if there were, you know, if they said, what did Paul mean when he said X, Y, or Z, uh, that she might have said, well, I, yeah, I was there when he wrote it and we talked about it and this is what it means. Which means, and here's, here's my take home point, which excites me, that the first authorized interpreter of probably the most significant theological text in the history of Christianity that is Romans, was a woman. I, I think that's a plausible historical conclusion to draw from this. Now, of course, the Gospels of Matthew and John would have something to say about me saying Romans is the most important theological. But, but it's definitely Matthew, John, and Romans. There's no question those are the top three in influence. So it's in the top three for sure. So Phoebe, uh, we could talk more about the word Diakonos and prostatis, the Greek words behind her that I wrote, wrote about in, in the uh, article too. But, but I kind of wanted to give you that, that to me, that, that interesting and new, new piece of scholarly argumentation about Phoebe as the courier and what that might mean. Another important woman that's been erased from this section of Romans 16, uh, 
who's been written about quite a bit is Junia, which is a in Romans 16, verse 7, and this is in the lectionary, so she's not technically erased from the lectionary, uh, but for much of Christian history, her name was changed um, to be a man's name. So in Romans 16, 7, Paul says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and my fellow prisoners. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me, before I was. So what do we learn from this text? Well, if you look at the manuscript history of this, that name Junia was, for much of history, Junias, with a, with a consonant on the end. Just like in many of our languages that, that, that we know, um, you can have a feminine or masculine form of a name, like Paul and Paula, or Michael and Michelle, or things like that. So at some point, copyists were, uh, either intentionally or, or subconsciously making this name feminine, uh, making this name masculine. But the oldest manuscripts of the, the Greek New Testament um, have, have this as a woman's name, which, which makes perfect sense in Paul's mind, Andronicus and Junia. And so here she's called not only uh, among the apostles, but prominent among the apostles or outstanding or significant among the apostles. Uh, and in Christ before Paul was, that is, a, which would make her a very, very early Christian, right? If she's if she's before Paul, and now in Paul's time, what did apostle mean? Apostle, the Greek word means one who sent or sent out or commissioned for a task or dispatched for something, which is why Mary Magdalene gets the title, right? Apostle, apostolorum, apostle the apostles. So, so in Paul's mind, this in Paul's um, thinking. This would probably only mean the fact that Junia was a witness of the resurrected Lord. And this is, uh, this is what he believes it to mean for himself, that he's witnessed the resurrected Lord, which makes him an apostle, right, who has been commissioned uh, by God, by, by, by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so we could say more about Junia, but... Um, that one also has been, I could recommend uh, books, books and articles to read about her as well. Uh, the third woman of Romans 16 that I, that I wrote about in a Commonwealth article in which I'll talk about right now, as good as the other two are, uh, Prisca is still my favorite. I have, a, I have a very, I have a very, my imagination has run wild my whole life about who she was and what her story was because she appears uh, you know, five times in the New Testament and she's prominent here in Romans 16. She's prominent in the book of Acts. She is clearly the most important early Christian woman that people have never heard of, not even debatable. She's, you know, we've heard of Mary Magdalene, we've heard of the Virgin Mary. Prisca is the most important that, that people haven't heard of. So what does Paul say in Romans 16? He's, he's commended Phoebe, who's carrying a letter, and the first name he says in his greetings, remember, he's trying to ingratiate himself with all these people that don't know him, greet Prisca and Aquila. Now, Prisca is a woman's name. Aquila is a man's name. We don't know. They're always, they're always mentioned together. Sometimes she's mentioned before him. Other times he's mentioned before her. She's also sometimes called Priscilla. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I am grateful, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church at their house. So, the first house church he greets in the city of Rome in the mid-first century, he says, greet Prisca and Aquila. So they, they have been in some way his travel companions. Um, one, one scholar who's written about them argues that they're an advanced evangelism team. <laughs> they, like they're like, they go to a place before he gets there and establish these kind of connections that he would need when he arrives, right? Where are we gonna stay? How are we gonna get money? How are we gonna get food? Who's safe? Are there Christians there already? Are there opponents of us there already? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, where can we get some good falafel? You know, like these kind of things that you might want to know before you arrive in a place. 
And, and so they've risked their lives. And he says that all of the churches of the Gentiles know about them, that, that, that they're, they're, you know, they're mentioned in Corinth, they're mentioned in Ephesus, and here now they're mentioned in Rome. So they're located, Prisca is located in three of the most important centers of early Christianity, just by the New Testament itself. And remember, remember, we're not reading between the lines, right? This is not, this is not radical interpretation. We're not reading between the lines. We're reading the, te- the words that have always been there. Uh, but just missed because of intentional or or subconscious bias. And greet also the church that meets in their house. So you can read more. Um, that, that was that was the the basic version of the article. But uh, Junia, Phoebe, and and Prisca. Junian, uh, Phoebe is not an electionary. Junia is there, but for much of history, she was a man's name in the manuscripts. And Prisca is there, um, but never, but barely, like, ne- and, and certainly never preached upon. Oh, I should also say Romans 16, um, but Romans 16, 3 to 9, and Acts 18, where Prisca is a teacher, or she teaches a man in Acts 18, both of those are on a weekday Saturday. So, I don't know, I don't know about your mass going schedule, but I can tell you that Weekday Saturdays are <laughs> fairly low attendance, so it's it's not even a prominent um, prominent um, placement, even if they are there. Oh, I could go on. For, I, I'm going on too long. Let's 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 move on. I want to give you some more some more examples that you may have never uh, may not have thought about. Oh, I see. There's chatting here. I wasn't looking at the chat. I'll look at the chat later I, I, on the Zoom. Okay. Um, so. So my next question, um, talk, we'll go for about yeah seven more minutes here or so. My next question um, that I would love to ask those who are putting the lectionary together and, and those who have erased some of these women is, Paul really likes his community at Philippi. His community at Philippi, he's happy, happy with. There's good stories in the book of Acts. Letter to the Philippians is one where he's not upset you know, not upset with the community. Um, he's, they seem to be a fairly wealthy early Christian community and can support his ministry well. Um, when, but when you look at who who's, has authority there at the church in Philippi, it's pretty hard to deduce. Uh, we don't have a clear, we don't have uh, clear messages about that, except um, in the book of Acts, when they go to Philippi in Acts 16, uh, the first person mentioned there is named Lydia. You may have heard of her if you've studied early Christian women. A dealer in purple cloth uh, has has some wealth. That's, that's obviously an expensive thing to produce in antiquity, associated with wealth and and then later royalty. Uh, and so it says that that they that Lydia hosts them uh, in in her in her home. And then they go off and they do the kind of famous scene of converting people in the jailers in prison. And there's a miracle, miracle in the prison with Paul and Silas. But at the end of that section, uh, which is not in the lectionary, uh, at the end of Acts 16, what happens is after all of this story is played out, then it says that uh, Paul and his companions, when they have come out of the prison, they went back to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers, and and then they left, and then they left Philippi. That little verse um, is not in the lectionary, and I feel like it frames the story differently. Because when we get Lydia at the beginning of the story, it's like, oh, they arrive in a new town, and they meet someone, and here's who she was, and and she says, oh, I'll host you, you know, because, again, because there's no Airbnb, and she's got to have somewhere to stay that's safe. But the author of Acts makes very clear that after this whole chapter has happened, you know, they go back to Lydia's house. And so she's, uh, she's the main person that you you think of there in the book of Acts as being sort of in charge, right. As as a host of, of a house church. But then when we read Paul's letter to the Philippians itself, again, when when we're looking at this section of of greetings of who's there, he's made his arguments, he's given this beautiful, beautiful bit in Philippians 2, it's very famous, 
He's corrected them on some of the things he's upset about. And then he says in chapter four of Philippians, therefore, <clears throat> brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And then he says, I urge Euodia and I urge Suntuke to come to a mutual understanding in the Lord. Now, this is just one sentence. It's not in the lectionary. Uh, but it's fascinating. These are two uh, feminine names. These are two women's names. Uh, one meaning something like smells good, Euodia, <laughs> and one meaning something uh, like a good fortune, Suntuke, has good, good for someone with good fortune. Nice, nice, beautiful names. Why would Paul talk to these two women and urge them to come to some agreement? Now, you could take a misogynist view and say that, which many people have, and say that these women were causing some kind of a problem. I don't take that view at all. I think that we know when people are causing problems in Paul's letters because he is really upset about it and gives very specific instructions about things. It seems much more likely to me that Paul is trying to get two women to agree about something because they have some kind of authority in the community because they are in some way leaders and that he has two leaders who are disagreeing. Now, I don't know what we would, I don't think we have to say they're, they have like official titles. I don't, I don't, I don't know that we have to, or that as a historian, I could go that far, but I'm very comfortable saying these are in some way leaders in Philippi and that Paul's encouraging them to get along for that reason. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so who's who's in charge at Philippi? We've got Lydia in the book of Acts, and we've got Euodia and Suntikai mentioned as the first people mentioned there um, in Philippians. Um, many other. Let me let me let me pick like two more things, and then then I'll wrap up here. There are a couple other uh, another another way of thinking about the lectionary or analysis of the lectionary that's important to, for us, and that is not not just when women are uh, erased, meaning not present at all, or relegated to a weekday Saturday, um, which is basically being erased, but when women's stories are optional for the reader. So you're familiar with this if you're a lector or um, if you studied the lectionary that there are brackets around readings to make them shorter uh, for pastoral reasons, I believe it says. Um, what is sad about this is that in some cases, the optional parts are the women's parts of, of the story. So uh, a good example here would be in Luke, Luke chapter two, when um, Jesus, uh, or uh, when Jesus' birth is, is discussed by prophets in the Jerusalem temple, uh, Simeon and Anna. And Simeon's line is famous, you know, Lord, let my servant depart in peace. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, set to music all the time, but Simeon and Anna are a pair, and Luke does this very carefully in both Luke and Acts, where he often pairs men, male and female representatives of of an idea in his stories. Uh, but Anna's Anna's ver, um, voice in that story is part of the optional reading for that part, and it's in the Sunday lectionary. Uh, another example in the Sunday lectionary uh, of something that's optional that bothers me and should I'm sure will bother you is uh, the parable of the leaven or the parable of the yeast. This is one of Jesus' parables that talk that uh, talks about a woman kneading dough, right? A woman using yeast in dough. Here during the pandemic, we know everyone's baking, right? So this is a very relevant um, parable for our time. But that parable of the leaven um, is, is in brackets. It's optional, uh, which absolutely um, bothers, absolutely bothers me. There are so precious few uh, examples in Jesus' own teaching where he elevates uh, and uh, elevates a feminine figure in one of his, in one of his parables, like right? the lost coin being the most prominent, but this parable of the lemon of the leaven, uh, I think could also be thought about as, as a real, a real sadness that it's made optional. I, I'm going to conclude with, um, hmm, I'm in danger of making us angry when I conclude, but, but I, I, we, ha we have to talk about Proverbs. 
we have to we have to circle back now to conclude with Proverbs because this one is uh, this one is perhaps the most dangerous of the lectionary's moves and and one of the more influential passages. So at the end of Proverbs in chapter thirty one, and in my uh, in my Catholic study Bible here. It's given, it's given a heading, which I will try to show you. Hold on. Let's see if I can do it. Um, because these headings, of course, are not in the original manuscript. But can you see that? The ideal, the ideal wife, right? So there's, there's an editorial, um, editorial judgment on what to call this section. So this is in Proverbs 31, and, and this is how I'll conclude. Proverbs 31 now is in the lectionary. This section is in the lectionary, but it's one of those where there are like three verses and then a break, and then two verses and then a break. You've seen these before, right? These drive me absolutely nuts. And they they also, most, most scholars, they drive nuts where things are getting carved up, right? That were meant to be whole. So if we just have the part that's in the lectionary, we learn that a worthy wife is valued beyond pearls, her husband entrusts his heart to her. She brings good, not evil. She obtains wool and flax and makes cloth with skillful hands. She puts her hat, puts her hands to the distaff. So she she does, you know, she makes clothing, she weaves, she reaches out her hands to the poor, extends her arms to the needy, she's charitable. These are all wonderful things, no doubt. Um, and that beauty is fleeting, but other other rewards that are worthy of praise, right? None of that's wrong. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's all important. But look what the inter intervening verses say. Like merchant ships, she secures provisions from afar. She rises while it's still night and distributes food to the household. She picks out a field to purchase. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She is girt with strength, sturdy are her arms. She enjoys the success of her dealings, etc., etc., um, her husband is prominent at the city gates as he sits with elders of the land. She makes garments and sells them. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs at her days to come. She opens her mouth in wisdom and on her tongue is kindly counsel. And that's not even all the verses. Uh, there are several more in there. So think about the, the variegated and full picture of of this of the woman that's envisioned at the at the end of proverbs here an image of abundance of productive labor an image of prosperity an image of success as an entrepreneur <laughs> an image of of wisdom and count a good counsel all of these things uh, are there when we get the full the full version of of proverbs 31 so I know I've gone over a little bit from the time there, but you, you've you met professors before, so you know that that's, that, that, that's totally uh, just being in character. Um, I, hope that, I hope that what I've given you here is uh, at least for, for um, at least one or two new things for everybody, right? I'm, I'm trying to think about the ground that's not always covered uh, in these conversations. Um, and I, although there is, there is some, uh, there is always some sadness that it, that the Bible is an androcentric book and a frequently misogynist book. And I have to say, the lectionary in some ways can be worse even than the Bible on this on this front. And so there is some sadness there. Uh, I hope that with an organization thinking about the future, that it's an organization that also has a little bit of hope about the ways in which are even these same resources like the same old texts right even the same old texts can can be mined for for new hope and for new life and and for new models so thank you for the invitation and um i'm now going to look at these chat questions which i haven't been looking at so um i don't know deb are you moderating next yeah. year or i'm i'm going to moderate um okay so thanks michael so much um good so i wanted i wanted uh Tell everybody how this is going to go, this next part. So if you want to ask a question, unmute your mic 
but don't ask the question until I call on you because I've got it. We've got a lot of people on this call and we're going to try to help make this make sense for everybody. So when you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute. And then I will, I will try to ask, I will call on you in order so that you can ask your question. Once you ask your question and just keep it to a question, no commentary, nothing else, because there's so many people have questions, you know, then mute yourself again and we'll move on. Uh, Michael, I wanted to start with one question that did come up in the chat that I thought was useful. And it, um, it was uh, the first, the question that someone asked was, how do we get the lectionary changed? <laughs> and then I'm gonna ask Colin someone else. Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, you know, there was a, there was a synod on the word of God in 2008, I think. That's right. And these synods come out with, you know, with, um, recommendations and, and there have been synods more recently that were much, much more, uh, you know, covered by the media for controversial events that happened to them. The synod on the word of God did not get that much coverage really, but, but one of the recommendations was for reform of the lectionary, reform of the lectionary. It did not mention anything about misogyny or gender egalitarianism. Uh, I think it was aimed primarily, if I remember correctly, at getting closer toward harmony with other Christian denominations and their lectionaries, both Orthodox and Protestant. So that, I think that was the original goal of that. And, and perhaps having some fuller treatment of the Hebrew scriptures, longer, some longer readings, such as happened in Protestant lectionaries. That's the only time I've heard at the highest levels this being mentioned since I've been studying it. There, there, I mean, there are always scholars and various, various uh, ecclesial figures who are interested in these sort of things, but that's the only time that I heard of it. Uh, sadly, I feel like it's pretty low on the priority level of, of offices at the Vatican, um, as far as I can tell. So there, to be a little bit more positive, there are certainly individuals open, open to that conversation at the highest levels, but, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the likelihood is of this, of this breaking through as a, as an issue that gets attention. Okay, thank you. So Victoria McDonald, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate um, all that you've had to say. Can you comment on the the scripture stories of the women who are unnamed? Um, so we, uh, do you have any, do you have, I mean, there are, there are a lot. Do you have any particular examples that you have in mind? I, I'm not sure because I'm not sure if you're referring to um, like general general pr um, descriptions of behavior or kind of the uh, general um, rules or specific stories. Specific stories. So, for instance, uh, the bent over woman, the woman with the hemorrhage, and uh, the Syro and the Syrophoenician women. Those three. Well. Um, so I, I didn't, because they're all, uh, at least Syrophoenician, those are all, I think those are all in the lectionary, if I'm not, if I'm not mis I mean, certainly the woman of the flow of blood and, and the Syrophoenician woman are in the lectionary, so I didn't think about preparing them for today. Um, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, I'd have to double check, but that the woman with the flow of blood, um, that, that story has brackets around the ending. Yes, yes. In the sense that um, it doesn't, the story doesn't have to be finished in the lectionary. That's right. That's right. And, and it's rarely used on Sunday. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, no, so it's true. I think, I think the Syrophoenician woman is more, um, well, not sorry, more interesting. That's not the right word, but is maybe more powerful as a, because she rebukes Jesus, you know, because she has, she has, a very powerful, you know, moment of dialogue with him. And in that case, it's not so much the lectionary 
to look at is, is the homiletics, it's how, how that story is preached, yeah. right? How that text is interpreted, which is not always um, not always drawing on that the tension of the of the of the rebuke. Yeah. To Jesus. So Ann Burke, would you like to ask your question? No, no, no. I, I just put myself on mute, on, on mute to listen to everybody. That's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, Jane um, Malhrata. Yeah, Malhotra. Um, hi, thanks. Great presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the, there's a new comprehensive Catholic lectionary that um, I heard about through Women's Ordination Conference that was put together by Jane Via and somebody else. And I was wondering if you're familiar with that or what you think about that approach to kind of just putting out other models of the lectionary and seeing if they get picked up. I have not. I have not heard about it. So, um, what is its what is its in, its intention? Is to lengthen the readings, or what's the um... uh, to uh, make gender inclusive language and oh, yeah. um, highlight the stories that have been cut out, like the ones you're talking about? So, um, is that is that referred to in Regina Bosclair's article about amnesia in the lectionary? I, I can't remember for sure, but um, I, I think, I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think so. I think well, so would the uh, would the question be what is the likelihood of like individual individual parishes picking it up, or the likelihood of it making its way through an ecclesial like a, a larger ecclesial structure? Because I think those are different answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about both. I mean, using that kind of path of creating something better and then start putting that out. And see who picks it up. What what do you think of that path? Or yeah. well, I think I think it's uh, I think we have to try an all hands on deck approach for all of this. So anything that can get in the hands of interested uh, local and re local and regional leaders to improve homiletics and to ex there's, there's not there's no reason. And so any of that is a good thing because, for example. There's no reason why uh, a homilist, any, anyone preaching, couldn't, for example, when the Exodus 1 story is read, couldn't then get up there at the beginning of the homily and say, you know, there's a, there's a section in the middle that wasn't provided just there, and let's read it, and let's comment on it, right? And, and that sort of awareness, I would think, on the part of the homilist could be, could be greatly increased by an, a, an awareness campaign, so to speak, that might be generated by something like a more inclusive lectionary. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's how I would see it being more likely. I'm sorry to be pessimistic about ecclesial change <laughs> at the highest levels, but um, I think I don't know. I feel I feel like the 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 likelihood of success there would be by the distribution and influence of kind of individual preachers who realize maybe didn't even think to uh, think to notice about how some of these stories were clipped clipped off right before they get to the women or uh, or had omissions from the middle of them. Right. So can we have Kay Ferlani? I hope I'm saying that correctly. You can ask yes. a question. Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask if you could say more, uh, tell us more about Lydia. I was in Greece on the pilgrimage le recently with Chris and Russ, and when we heard about her and I saw how much she was um, honored, really, in the Greek Orthodox Church, I really kind of felt angry that I hardly know or don't know anything really about her except her name, because the Roman Church hasn't told us anything. Yeah, um, well, we, we, in terms of the scriptures, we don't know very much. Uh, there's always, there's always, local traditions and, and about any about any saints about you know that that mm -hmm. carries on uh, but in so in Acts 16 when uh one of the interesting things about when we meet her in Acts 16 is that we meet her in what's uh what's called what are one of what are called the the we passages of Acts if you're reading along in the book of Acts you get to the parts where it shifts to the first person it's normally a third person narrative. They did this, they did that. But then there are a few parts in travel sections where it says, we set sail from Troas. 
and then we went here and went there to Philippi, and I went here. And this is in one of those sections where, where they, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate along the river where we thought there would be a place of prayer. We sat and spoke with the women who had gathered there, one of them, a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth uh, from a nearby city, a worshiper of God, listened, and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. After she and her household had been baptized, she offered us an invitation. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed on us. So this is fast. This has fascinated people for, for centuries because it's a first person we, but it refers to Paul in the third person. So it's not Paul talking. Mm -hmm. So one of the, one of the theories that's been around a long time is that because these are all sections about travel, uh, sorry, a theory among New Testament scholars is that the author Luke, who compiled the book of Acts, had access to sources, some of which were people that he talked to, and some of which were texts, and that one of those texts uh, was someone's travel journal mm -hmm. from having traveled with Paul. Now, this led to a tradition that Luke was the travel companion and himself uh, that's not necessarily doesn't have to be the case. It could because he says in chapter one that he consults sources, but it, so it could be someone else's travel journal. In any case, that's in this section, which gives it even more of a feeling of um, verisimilitude, if I can use a very professory word. Uh, you know, it feels very real because it's in this first person narrative. So all we know about her is is that that she was uh, one of these women on the Sabbath who was in prayer. So she's called a worshiper of God, which um, the, the Greek word uh, tends to mean a, a Gentile who was um, had some devotion to the God of Israel or devotion to a monotheistic God or was, had, and a, was appealed to by a, the idea of a monotheistic uh, God. And so was, if not a convert to Judaism, was... Uh, a close confidant of Jews in her in her area, so she was already sort of a one foot in, if you will, to to the covenant with the God of Israel. So that's that's what we know from that section, and that she's uh, uh, she's characterized as wealthy and the head of a household. So when we get a woman named as the head of a household in the Roman Empire, who's wealthy, almost certainly she's a wealthy widow. And when we say the word widow in the ancient, in the Roman Empire, that doesn't mean she was old. Mm -hmm. She could have been 25. I mean, there's no yeah. people, people, you know, die very young. Um, I often joke with my students that if you're, if you're, if you're a woman in the Roman Empire, the absolute best thing that could happen to you is to be betrothed to a very rich man who gets sent off in the military and dies immediately. This is the, <laughs> This is the greatest thing because there's no pressure to remarry and you have all this money and it's wonderful. Do whatever you want. Then you get and you can go learn Hebrew and you can get your education and you know or start your business or everything. I'm sort of joking, but sort of not. I mean, Saint Jerome, centuries later, you know, he's got all these wealthy Roman widows that are studying with studying Hebrew with him because what else are they gonna? They're having to get. They don't have to work. Like uh, that's anyway. That's centuries later, but. So she's probably a wealthy widow um, and has has a kind of household and a very successful business and uh, and she welcomes them. So if early Christianity started in houses, which we know it did, um, not only started in houses but continued in houses for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. uh, and if they were meeting, you know, in places where there were wealthy widows who ran households, it seems very likely that. That Lydia was one of them, and that she continued to be influential uh, there, there in Philippi. I wish we—I mean, we don't know that much more from the text. We can kind of squeeze on each word, but um, most of the rest of Lydia's story would be, you know, generated later in the realm of tradition. Mm -hmm. There is a church in Brooklyn called Saint Lydia's that's a relatively well-known Protestant church that was founded as a as a dinner church. Mm -hmm. It's founded as a um 
you know, as a, as a, as an evening full meal church of hospitality, um, around, around a full dinner. Um, Emily Scott founded it for a friend of mine. Um, anyway, so she, her, her, her legacy lives on. So let me just, we we're we're already past time. I just want to give one more question. Uh, can Natando Hadebe, she's from South Africa. So I think I'd like to give her a chance to ask a question. So Natando, will you go ahead? Um, yes, just to thank uh, for the for the presentation. Uh, I think the first thing that's, uh, that I put my question out there, it, is this not an ethical issue? Uh, the fact that you, the, 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 they are intentional about excluding women and then portraying the lectionary as if it is the whole Bible. I don't know. It just struck me as an ethical issue. Um, that, that It's a question of, it's ethics. They're intentional about exclusion, uh, exclusion of women, and also at the same time portraying that they are giving us the whole Bible. Uh, well, abs absolutely, it's an ethical issue. Um, I would say that they, the lectionary is never, it's never intended to give the, the whole Bible in, in a way that uh, like a Calvinist or a Protestant church would be where you kind of read through the whole thing over a certain number of years. But it, it, they have said, Roman Catholic officials and official documents have said that they're opening up a, a rich, a richer treasury of the Bible, that Vatican II wanted to open up a richer treasury of the word of God. And with regard to the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I would say they certainly did. And with regard to some other aspects of the Bible, the Psalms, for example, they certainly did. But with the, the Hebrew scriptures and the epistles, um, they're not fulfilling that, you know, that vision very well. And I think the, the ethical, the, the, the times when we would say there's an ethical problem would be the examples such as, well, Proverbs 31 or, that I read, where you can't accidentally delete all of the parts where a woman is industrious from a text, right? That, that seems unbelievably obvious to me that there is an intentional move there. Um, I think eliminating the Hebrew midwives, possibly in some realm of thinking it's not intentional, it's a, someone trying to shorten a text and not thinking clearly about it, but, but even there, it, it, seems, it seems to be in the realm of, of a bias that a bias that we would call ethically faulty. Mm -hmm. I mean, these the lectionary was produced by a, a group, at Vatican II, the, the current lectionary that had a, a multi-year study session that led to all this. They they brainstormed lots of different ideas. They consulted with ancient lectionaries. They consulted with Protestant reading practices, Jewish lectionaries. They did a lot of really great work, and I read. I've read their whole, all their all their notes exist. By the way, that I went to the no, Notre Dame has a Vatican II archive, oh. um, where they're all in Latin, sadly. But the, the, all, I, I, I photocopied all the notes of the lectionary study. It's called Study Group Eleven. Study Group Eleven was the lectionary, and I, I read through all of those, and you don't get any sense of nefarious behavior. You know, you don't. You don't get a sense that they're trying to to do this, uh, but but they had they had some very real blinders. Uh, even if this was in the late 1960s, the set these the the priests and scholars who were doing this were formed in their formation 30 or 40 years earlier in some cases. You know, so they're still um, kind of thinking in those in those ways that that were at at, at least biased and at most outright you know, misogynistic. So, so I absolutely agree with you that it is an ethical question of how, of, of the ways in which um, God is being allowed to speak through scripture um, in the lectionary, in the context of the mass. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions, everyone. Thank you, Michael. This has been just incredibly informative and helpful. Um, if you have more questions, you can send them to me, Deb Rose at futurechurch.org. Uh, I know there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the chat room. I know that Russ is, thank you, Russ, for 
you know, answering people's questions and sending out links and so forth. We'll make sure you get links to everything. I did send most of that in the, the letter I sent you today, but I will send it back out again with uh, other information that you've asked for, our prayers. I, I saw a lot of things fly through. So, um, so I want to just finish up here. Uh, Russ has a few announcements. We have Linda and, and Phil Marson are, are going to do our closing prayer, and uh, then we'll close her down. So, Russ, yeah. would you like to make your... Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep this quick. Okay, go ahead. It's pretty long. Just to say that if you are um, interested in um, liturgy uh, right now that's inclusive of women's experiences and uses inclusive language, ordinarily at this time on Wednesdays, Future Church is hosting an online liturgy of the word and faith sharing. And um, you're more than welcome to join us. We'd love to have you. Uh, it's about 25 minutes is the actual liturgy, but then 25 minutes right after the gospel and the Catholic Women Preach Reflection is the um, is about 25 minutes worth of just faith sharing and uh, responding to some questions about the um, about the readings and some small groups for groups of four to five. Um, everyone who's attended has really enjoyed that. I'll say on Palm Sunday. Um, the lectionary ends um, without mentioning the women who are standing uh, on, uh, standing by watching um, the cross, uh, watching Jesus die on the cross. And we read that at our, um, at our liturgy. So if you go to futurechurch.org, uh, you can see links there to sign up. And also, um, just to draw your attention to another series that we're having, I think many of you have probably all already seen this and signed up, but um, Sister Christine Schenk and Sister Teresa Kane, uh, two um, amazing women whose names and stories we should continue to tell over and over uh, for future generations are going to be uh, with us on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's Tuesday nights, June, 6th, June 19th, June 26th. I'm sorry, May 19th, May 26th, and June 2nd. Yeah. So go to futurechurch.org. It's called To Speak the Truth in Love. It's um, Sister uh, Chris is going to lead us through her new biography of Sister Teresa Kane. And Sister Teresa is going to be there to provide additional commentary and insights. They're going to be three marvelous nights. Um, I think those were the three announcements that I, or the two announcements that I, I really wanted to get out there. Um, and for the sake of time, I will turn things over now to um, Linda and Phil, who are future church people from the very beginning. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Just a note before the final prayer. After we mention each part of our bodies, we will pause just for a moment and invite each of you to make a sign of blessing on your own body. As we go forth to recover and reclaim the women of our faith, we do so enlightened by our presenter, strengthened by this community, and by the grace of God who blesses us beyond all measure. In blessing our foreheads, we claim the power to contend with the complex issues of our time while remembering the simplicity of the gospel message of love and justice. In blessing our eyes, we claim the power to see and denounce the forces of darkness in our midst and to see and rejoice in the light of God's presence. In blessing our ears, we claim the power to deeply hear the voices of the silenced, the oppressed, the marginalized, and those who suffer any injustice. In blessing our lips, we claim to name ourselves, to tell the stories of our foremothers in faith, to speak truth to power. In blessing our hearts, we claim the power to respond to one another in love. In blessing our hands and feet, we claim the power to take up the work placed before us, that we might 
co-create with God a new way. In blessing each other in our wholeness, We claim ourselves as children of God, good, holy, and loved. Amen. Amen. Thank you very, very much. So I just, final thank you to Michael. It's been so marvelous. It is just, it's like being in your classroom. It's just been wonderful. Many blessings on you, your family, your mother, uh, you know, your your world, and blessings on everyone here. I hope you're all safe. I hope you're all healthy. I hope the people you love are healthy. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we will continue to pray for you. And uh, just to re- remind you all that during these difficult times, these sort of activities uh, require some support. So if you can, we know it's tough. If you can, we would appreciate any support you can send our way. Uh, so Thank you all again for joining us. It has been a total joy. So thank you again. And good night, everyone.